So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to this press conference with the special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. We apologize for the delay. There was a little bit of a scheduling mix-up, but uh, now we are back on track. And now hand the floor to Mr. Tomas Ojea Quintana to give some brief opening remarks before we turn it over to questions from you. Go ahead, Mr. Quintana. Ojea Quintana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. We're, uh, Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, yesterday afternoon, I presented uh, my report to the third committee of the General Assembly. The main substantive issues of that report, I will um, brief it uh, you on that, uh, has to do first with the situation of uh, the right to adequate uh, food in, in the DPR Korea. Uh, and I made a, a clear point about uh, the dire situation of uh, a vast uh, number of people in, the, in, North, in North Korea. We, had a, we, has a, we are under food insecurity um, with the problems uh, of undernourished. Uh, and, um, and this is, of course, uh, the main responsibility of the, of the government to address the situation of, of these people. But there are also some other factors who are um, um, influencing this situation. I would like to then uh, share with you my, my views on that and, and respond to your questions. Um, the problem of food in, in, in North Korea is especially concerning since we all know the famine during the 1990s, which is in the, in the, in the, in, in the memories of the, of, the, of the people, the relative, those who survive. Um, so... Um, to have a food insecurity, to be a person with food insecurity in North Korea, uh, imagine w what it's be to uh, every day, you know, uh, wake up and uh, uh, trying to face the need to pro procure food during that day, having in mind what happened during the 1990s. So uh, this is clearly a human rights issue that the government has a, responsible, a responsibility to, to attend. Um, I also refer to the, the, th the situation of, um, of the, of the uh, freedom of expression in the country. Um, the newspapers, the radio, the television, and the internet is completely controlled by the government, continues to be under the control of the government. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the, this is against the basic uh, international human rights standards regarding freedom of expression. Um, I also, as usual, always include in my report the, the serious situation of the political prison camps, so-called Kwan Liso. I should be very clear on this, on this issue. The information that uh, I have received in regard to these camps is very little. It's very little. Um, um, but uh, when I talk to the escapees, those who were recent escaped from North Korea, it is clear that these camps continue to exist, that the population uh, continue to live in entrenched fear of being sent to those political prison camps. And I will let you know, if you want to know more about it, uh, what was the, the, one of the statements of the government at the UPR process in Geneva on this issue, particular issue? Uh, in addition to these uh, substantive issues, I also um, refer to the situation of, the, of the, those who escape North Korea and are arrested in, in China, in the border area, and what is their situation, and also the risk of being repatriated uh, to the country, and how this would... Uh, uh, um, uh, this is uh, this is something that is not is contrary to international principles, especially the principle of non refoulement So I have been ex engaging with Chinese government to raise my concern about uh, the repatriation cases. Uh, 
Um, and finally, I, uh, I, yesterday I tried to discuss with member states that the, the, my intention to try to engage with the government of, of the DPR Korea. I, I ha it has been already three years with this mandate, uh, and I continue to reach out to the authorities to try to engage with them, to try to make, make them understand that this mandate that I hold is, 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 was meant to engage with the government, to build a trust, confidence, a dialogue, uh, uh, and we are ready to help them to improve the human rights situations on the ground. And the final statement that I made is that, uh, and I've been, I have been meeting all stakeholders involved in the denuclearization conversations, and I, had, I, ha I have made a clear point that human rights should be part and should be integrated in those negotiations. Um, yeah, and I share with them some benchmarks on human rights that can be introduced in the negotiations. I believe that for uh, integrating human rights in these negotiations is fundamental for the sustainability of any denuclearization agreement and for peace, for peace in the Korean Peninsula and beyond. So I will leave it there and uh, I will uh, be happy to respond to your question. Thank you. So the first question usually goes to the representative of the UN Correspondents Association. Please go ahead, Edie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Quintana. Um, my name is Edith Lettera from the Associated Press, and welcome on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Thank you for doing this briefing. Um, in your report, you on the issue of repatriations I mean, from, Ch from China to back to the DPRK. You said you had been engaging with the Chinese government. I wonder if you could elaborate a little on how that engagement's going. You said you were hopeful that this would lead to greater compliance with international standards. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, on the recommendations from the Universal Periodic Review, you specifically mentioned um, one recommendation which was accepted by the government to grant immediate free and unimpeded access to international humanitarian organizations to provide assistance to the most vulnerable groups, including prisoners. Um, what's been done, what is being done perhaps, or what should be done to follow up on this? Thank you. Okay, let me, let me respond to these two very important questions. Thank you. Um, Again, I appreciate the engagement with the Chinese government. I should say that. Um, although the Chinese government, in, in these cases, they say that they do not apply the refugees, the refugee convention. Even though they are a state party to the refugee, refugee convention, they do not apply the refugee convention in regards to the North Korean escaping the country. But they have stated that they do apply humanitarian principles. That's how they put it, humanitarian principles. So I think that that was an interesting point of view from the Chinese government, because even under humanitarian principles, people should not be repatriated because they might face torture, ill treatment, and illegal imprisonment in, North, in, North, in the DPR Korea. So this is the kind of engagement that, that I'm having with the Chinese government. It's gradual, uh, but I think it, 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 it might lead, as I say, to uh, you know, a pos positive treatment of these escapees in, 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 in the territory of China. There are also some other countries that I have been requesting them to, uh, um, to, to uh, look into the situation of the escapees, especially the government of South Korea. Uh, uh, and the government of South Korea, when I visited uh, last June, they assured me that they are trying to support those escapees who uh, cross the border uh, into China. Uh, and they may, maybe they are not doing that at the high level, but uh, at the level of director generals in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they are trying to engage with the Chinese government to have contact with these escapees in China uh, on the ground. So I encourage uh, 
the government of South Korea to continue in this, in, in, in this direction. So this, uh, regarding the repatriation of escapees, uh, um, concerning the UPR process, let, let me say that the government of the DPR Korea seems to, uh, seems to be very interest, interested in the universal periodical review as the human rights mechanism of the United Nations that they were now going to engage with. So while they are rejecting my mandate as one of the UN human rights mechanisms, uh, they see the UPR process as a process that uh, they, will, they, they will accept. So this, this, is, this is something that I see from the government, which brings an opportunity, an interesting opportunity, to try to use this mechanism, the UPR process, to, to try to bring real uh, progress on the human rights on the ground. Because then the challenge of this process, then this mechanism, is that it, it is it's held every four years. So it is not clear how to implement, for example, the recommendation that you mentioned, which is very important and very interesting. Um, it's, it would be very interest, interesting to find out how this decision was made at the government level to allow y y uh, agencies, humanitarian agencies, to access to prisons, at least in paper that was agreed or accepted by the government. Now the question is how to follow up on that um, um, and how to engage with the government to try to see if our colleagues on the ground, the UN agencies, will be able at some point to access to detention facilities. There is also a challenge, a challenge on the side of uh, the UN country team, which they are already having challenges uh, on the ground to carry out their, their own mandate, their humanitarian mandate. So how these agencies would then be able to move towards uh, addressing the situation of persons in detention, it's, it's going to be a challenge for them. But in any case, I think this is a positive development. I am trying to encourage, encourage the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mrs. Bichette Bachelet, to engage more with the government of North Korea, to engage more, to open a channel of communication, regular communication, to develop a strategy of engagement with the government since the government seems to be sending some signals that they, were, they are willing to engage also more, for example, with the UPR recommendations. The government has also reached out, for example, the government of the UPR Korea has reached out some of ILO specialists to understand what is the ILO, how does it work. So these are interesting trends. Could I ask one quick follow-up? One, one follow-up from Edie, and then we'll move on to other questions from other people. Um, did the Chinese government say why they don't apply the refugee convention to um, people from the DPRK who have actually crossed a legal border? Yes, they actually, and this they have they have stated this in public. They consider them illegal migrants, which, of course, I, I, I would not dispute, but my point is that you, sometimes you can become a refugee surplus, which is that you may have crossed the border because of, let's say, economic reasons or personal reasons, but then once you arrive to the third country, and if you are repatriated and you might face ill treatment or torture, then you become a refugee surplus. Uh, and therefore, the principle of non refoulement applies. So to this argument, the government of China has not replied. But again, this entry point about the application of humanitarian principles to these cases is very important. I encourage you to also reach out to the Chinese authorities and make this point that they recognized that they applied humanitarian principles. And even alone on humanitarian principles, mm, uh, people should not be, be being repatriated to the North. 
I see NHK, please go ahead. Thank you very much for today's briefing. Uh, my name is Sato from NHK. Uh, the whole up to you this question. So, uh, Chinese government uh, don't apply uh, the defector as a the refugee, but uh, illegal migrant, uh, immigrant. But uh, also recognize, so like you said, that the uh, his Chinese government will treat the defector uh, in the context of the human uh, humanitarian principle. Yes. Does that the first time for the Chinese government recognized that this term, that humanitarian See, principle? Did the, did, did the Chinese government the first uh, recognized the uh, the principle, humanitarian principle, in terms of the uh, treating uh, defectors from the North Korea? That's what I said. That's mm. what they told me mm -mm. when I raised the cases of the of, of, of the SKPs mm. risking repatriation. This is what they responded to me. So, with your perception, the Chinese government will treat the uh, defector in case by case basis. Uh, it's difficult to say because uh, you should know that I don't have access to these areas in China. Uh, and even the UN agencies, UN, even EOHCR, uh, has difficulties to access to these areas to establish how exactly the government of China deals with uh, these cases, whether there is a more comprehensive policy which goes from one place, to, from, from, from one policy to another, or is a case-by-case -case treatment. It, it will be very difficult for me to say. I said yesterday, that I did receive information about some cases of people who have been recently repatriated. So that's of my concern, and I made a point <coughs> yesterday uh, with the delegate of China in the room, uh, very clear, that I hope um, that no more repatriation cases will take place in the future, and I encourage the government of China to apply humanitarian principles. Yes. Sorry. One last question. It, it's regarding to this uh, repatriation. So, uh, are you uh, communicating with any other government like Thailand and some of the Southeast Asian countries, which is uh, border with the China? I tried. I tried because these escapees, in the in their journey uh, from uh, DPR Korea towards South Korea, they. Uh, travel along many uh, different uh, countries, as you say, China, Laos. But uh, for, for the time being, it has not been possible for me to even visit these countries. I, I actually uh, uh, tried to visit uh, Thailand and to have uh, contact with, uh, with the escapees in, in Thailand. For me, uh, personal contact with uh, uh, these North Koreans who escape is critically, critically important, it's crucial, because, um, and especially those who recent uh, leave uh, the country, those who are not uh, been subject to the system of uh, adaptation in South Korea, or, uh, and, 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 and those who have fresh stories about what, what happens uh, in, in DPR Korea are very important, are my primary source of information. And of course, I bear in mind that many of the, most of these people are women, I should say. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course, they, their stories may not reflect the situation in the whole country because many of these people uh, live in the border areas or in provinces in the border area. Uh, but, uh, but uh, nevertheless, for me, are very important. It's very important for me to, to listen from them. As I say, I had I had not access to to these countries, to the th these third countries. Did we have other questions? Let's see. First, Frank, and then we'll go back to uh, Kyoto after that. Uh, okay. I want to follow up on that. Uh, can you? Tell us how that also plays into the issue of human trafficking, because it seems like China could be enabling that with a lot of these escapees. And also, 
In your report, you talked about public executions. Tell us how and where that happens and, and what they are executed for. Yeah, traffic, in, uh, as far as I know, the government of China is, is very much involved on the issue of trafficking. And I think that's an entry point to address the situation of the escapees because many of the escapees, as I say, are women and they are subject to smuggling, uh, trafficking, um, forced marriages in China as well. So there is a whole issue there that needs to be treated and I hope, and I, I understand that China is interested in addressing this problem. Um, it's, it's not completely under my mandate to, to deal with the issue of trafficking, etc. but uh, I think uh, it, it, deserve, uh, it deserves attention. Uh, in this last report, that I, I, I didn't make any reference to executions. Uh, it, it was press release. Um, press release is the latest press release. Say that again? The date on that press release is Right, okay. Address that? It's, it's not, that's what I'm saying. The, the, the press release, I don't know what you have there, but the... It's not an issue uh, that I address because basically um, that was an issue that came up when I visited South Korea in June that some organizations share with me information. If you want me to address that point. Here said, I'm concerned that public executions seem to still be happening. People continue to live in fear of such brutal acts and of being sent to Kwanliso. Yeah, that's from my last mission uh, uh, to South Korea in June, last June. Right. It's not part of this report, but I can address it anyway. Yeah, well, so what has changed? Has it gotten worse? Can you give us... It's, uh, uh, let me first, first make the point that the lack, again, the lack of access to the country, the lack of access to contact with the authorities puts me always in a position to uh, um, uh, be very careful in verifying the information that I receive or I can have a, I, I told you that my contact is with the escapees, and what I hear from them is that they have been hearing, it's like uh, about public executions. I don't have specific information on, about where, how, when this happened, against whom. It's impossible for me as, 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 as a reporter to member states to bring this information because I actually don't have it. But I have heard from, and, I, and I'm hearing from the escapees about the fear of being sent to Qualiso, to the political prison camp, and that allows me to say this continues to exist in North Korea, it is of my concern, and I, I'm also hearing from them about public executions taking place in the country without detailed information that I don't have. I'm sorry about that. I, I, I hope I wish I had access to the country in exchange with the government. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kintana. I'm Yamaguchi from Kyodo News Japan. Uh, let me ask you about uh, recommendations. Uh, uh, do you have any other instance of the recommendations which DPRK accepted? And do you have any information on the latest development of the uh, recommendations? And can you, can you tell us the reason? You said uh, DPRK seems to be interested in a UPR process. Uh, so can you tell us the reason why DPRK is interested in a humanitarian aspect this time. Thank you. You should know, as I said yesterday, that in the UPR process, which is a peer review, is a review of the human rights record of a country among member states. There are no experts like me, no commissioners, members of a committee, is a peer review. So member states made a large number of recommendations to the PR Korea, and they accepted among, uh, amongst that large number 132 recommendations. 
What, what does, it, does it mean that they accept? It means that they, they are willing to implement that recommendation, as simple as, as, as simple as that, but as complicated as how to verify when, how, to what extent each of these 132 recommendations will be applied. You see, this is something that the system so far is not providing, has not been established, you see? And uh, as I say, the, this UPR process takes place every four years. So, so, uh, so the, in the next four years, there's going to be a new session to verify the level of implementation. But in the meantime, it's n if nothing is being done in regards to, to, in regards to how to implement, it's going to be nothing on the ground, actually. So I mentioned one example of the recommendation. There are many recommendations on, for example, the right to food, the right to access to, uh, to improve water and sanitation, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so what I'm saying is it's a whole set of recommendations on social and economic rights, which are very important because we are talking about improving the livelihoods of the people living in the DPR Korea. So, uh, so this, these are the other kind of recommendations. These are recommendations connected to the International Labor Organization, I just told you, the ILO, which is interesting because if in the near future it's going to be a process of opening in the DPR Korea or let's say in improving the economic uh, situation as the leadership has stated in his New Year speech, we are looking for improving the economic situation in the country. So then is, there is going to be a need of uh, level of standardization on labor standards, on discrimination, on transparency, and accountability, etc. And they, uh, uh, an exchange uh, to start an exchange with ILO is very important, which is also part of one of the recommendations. So this is this is what's what's happening with the UPR process. Why I don't have an ax I, I don't have a response on why is it that. The, the DPR Korea is, is, is putting, let's say, all the eggs on this mechanism. But it is clear that uh, the, the country mandate that I hold for them is, 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 is the product of a politicization mechanism. It's a, it's a product of, of, of selectivity against single states. Um, and this is their position political position, position of principles. They don't see uh, the UPR process uh, 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 through this point of view. They, they see it in a mechanism which may be able to engage. This is, this is, this is w how I see the problem. The overall uh, view about the human rights agenda from the DPR Korea point of view is that historically, that human rights has been used as a threat, threatening to the, to, this, to, to the system. So it seems that now it's time to start changing, changing that perception from the North, that the United Nations uh, human rights agenda is not threatening their system, is looking for improvement of the rights and trying to contribute in improvement of the rights. And it seems that they are seeing the UPR process and an entry point with this new perception about the human rights agenda. Um, yes. Did we have further questions? Go ahead, the lady in the black. Maria Hrenova, TAS, uh, TAS News Agency. Uh, so you were talking about uh, the difficult situation in which DPR uh, people are living right now. Uh, do you think that uh, some, at least some easing of sanctions could help them, as uh, Russia and China repeatedly suggested to start the process of easing sanctions? Thank you. I do. I do think, and I stated that in my, in my report, and even in my mission in Seoul last June, I, uh, I supported a gradual lifting of sanctions 
So then ordinary citizens living in the DPR Korea can, can improve their livelihoods. That's, a, that's a, a my point of view, principal point of view as a human rights expert. I understand, uh, though, uh, and I said this before, that the Security Council is, is, is seeking compliance from the DPR Korea on the very important issue of denuclearization, which is, uh, which is a behavior which completely, is completely against, is, is against, is against the, the international um, accord about non-proliferation. So it is very clear that the Security Council is, 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 is trying to uh, stop the, the proliferation in DPR Korea of the nuclear uh, weapons and um, ballistic uh, technology, uh, ballistic mi missiles technology. Uh, but at the same time, when the sanctions regime targets the economy as a whole, which is the case of the sanctions regime of uh, the Security Council, uh, some uh, uh, part of the population will be suffering the consequences. And uh, I really welcome the Security Council um, es establishment of a, a, a procedure to exempt humanitarian agencies so they can carry out their mandate on the ground. That has been part of my discussions with this chair of the uh, Sanctions Committee of the Security Council. But going beyond that, again, I, I do support uh, easing of sanctions, uh, basically because we, the United Nations, um, in a holistic uh, approach, we need to bear in mind um, the consequences on, on ordinary people. Did you have a follow-up? Thank you about humanitarian exemptions. I know that the process sometimes is not going as fast as it could be. Uh, do you have any comments, any examples, probably like uh, in which requests um, it, it should be done more fast? I don't. I don't. The, the, last year I was briefed by different uh, UN agencies and also INGOs uh, from the U.S. as well, having, tr having problems not only with the sanctions regime of the U.N., but also this, the, the unilateral sanctions of the U.S. Um, as far as I was uh, informed during this trip here in New York, but also I've been in, I, I have been in, in, in Washington, D.C. last week, where I met U.S. officials, including the special representative of nuclear issues. Uh, and... Um, as far as, as I was reported, the, the, system, the system of exemptions has improved, and I don't have uh, more information about it. Unless we have further questions, I think we'll wrap up there. Thank you all very much for coming, especially on short notice. We apologize for that. Apparently it was due to circumstances beyond our control. So we hope to see you all back again here at 2 yeah, o'clock. Let me make one last um, comment, please. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to uh, underline that the, the strategy of trying to engage the government is very important for me as a mandate holder. But at the same time, I do support the important pillar of, of trying to hold accountable those who have committed serious human rights abuses in the DPR Korea. That's part of the UN mandate is still ongoing, uh, and we should never forget that uh, justice and accountability are important elements for a, for a sustainable peace uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for the people, more importantly, for victims and, and people uh, who have uh, been suffering these consequences. Yes. So thanks for those final comments. Uh, we hope to see you back here at 2 o'clock for the joint press conference uh, with the, uh, Ms. Yang Hee Lee, Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, and Mr. Marzuki Darusman, Chair of the Inter Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar. So that's at 2 o'clock back here in uh, room uh, 237. Thank you all very much.